Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to uh, welcome Jamie Redfern from the History of the United States and Etc. podcast, who is going to be speaking to us today about hidden in plain sight. Just one couple of things about uh, sort of housekeeping. Um, there's a panel on the right for general chat if you want to sort of comment on anything. But if you have specific questions for Jamie, at the bottom of your screen, um, there's a tab called Ask a Question, and, and you can um, put questions in there. Go for it, Jamie. Good luck. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Hello, anyone who's here. Very excited to be speaking with you today. First things first, I'll work out how to share my screen. I'll... That was easy. Uh, I don't want to give anything away. It's not a joke. Okay, now I can't see any chat, so I'll just assume that you can all see that and it's all working fine. This is eerily similar to so many uh, work calls over the last few months where I'm just talking away. Anyway, um, hello, everybody. Uh, firstly, thank you for joining my talk today. Um, in the Intelligent Speech Conference. Uh, I hope you're all having a great day so far. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Jamie Redburn. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, and I've been podcasting for over 10 years now. Uh, I started podcasting at the age of 16 while I was still in school. Uh, I thought it'd be a useful way to help me revise some of my courses. And here I am 10 years later. Uh, my first proper series was a biography of Alexander the Great, which led to a history of the Punic Wars, a series on the Arab Spring and 20th century Middle Eastern history. And now I'm five years into a series on American history. Oh, and you might also know me from uh, Facebook, running the uh, History Podcasts Facebook group. I'm on there quite a bit. Um, so when I found out that the theme of this year's conference was hidden voices and hidden stories, the obvious topic for me was the Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War. Uh, it's what I've spent the past couple of years working on, on my show. Um, for those of you who've listened to anything I've ever done, um, I have a thing for starting narratives in strange places and tangents, which led to a rather strange step when writing this paper, as within five minutes of when I started work on it, I realized that when I was writing about British policy in the Seven Years' War with regards to events of American independence, I was actually talking about Carthage and Rome during the Second Punic War. Bear with me, this will make sense eventually, and you'll understand why they're both unified by my paper's title, Hidden in Plain Sight. I'm sure you all know the story of the Second Punic War, uh, but I'll give you a quick one minute recap. Okay, let's get out the, uh, the proverbial timer and go. Carthage was a Phoenician settlement on the North African coast that tr traditionally dominated the Western Mediterranean. Rome was the up and coming power that got sucked into Greek power politics and ended up in Sicily, which you can see on the map. Um, they sparked a war. After 20 years, the Romans won and took over the island. The Carthaginian Hamilcar felt betrayed and made his son swear to be an enemy of Rome. Hamilcar went to Spain and his son Hannibal took command and sparked another war with Rome. He marched over the Alps with elephants, trounced the Romans at Cannae, but refused to march on Rome. The war effort stalled as Hannibal marched around Italy until he was forced to return to Africa by a Roman invasion led by Scipio. Scipio won at Zama, became Scipio Africanus. Hannibal left for exile in the East and Rome became the dominant power in the Mediterranean. Boom. Now, all of that is true. But it also isn't. The problem is caused by oversimplification. When you take out bits of the narrative to focus only on key events, as I've just done in a admittedly exaggerated format, um, it leaves you with a warped version of the story. Just take a look at the headline battles of the war, which I've got here. Trebia, 218. Lake Trezemini, 217. Kenai, 216, and Zama, 202. They're concentrated at either end of the war, while leaving out the 14 years in the middle that is the real story. The biggest misdirect of all is the casual reference to Hannibal refusing to march on Rome after his victory at Kenai, which some consider to be Hannibal's greatest mistake. 
Livy, one of our best sources for the period, even gives the Carthaginian general Mahabal a line saying, Hannibal, you know how to earn a victory, but not how to use it. This is misleading. 14 years happened between Kanai and Zama, which I earlier threw away in 17 words. The war effort stalled as Hannibal marched around Italy until he was forced to return to Africa. Those 17 words are the real story of the war. They ultimately show why Rome won and why Carthage lost. And very little of it has anything to do with major pitch battles, creative stratagems, or elephants. I only have limited time today, so what I'm going to do is give two examples of simple facts that can help to change your understanding of why Rome won and why Carthage lost. One, Italian and African politics. Two, supply and logistics. It's very tempting to view ancient states as akin to those of the modern world. They are, however, very distinct entities. Rome, during the Punic Wars, is often thought as Italy, but in reality it was a confederacy of semi-independent towns and cities, an Italian league. Rome was in charge, but it, the allies were allies, not subjects. Likewise, in Africa, Carthage was at the head of its own political network. The years after the First Punic War were tumultuous in North Africa, as Carthage fought to assert its authority there. As Hannibal grew up and learned about the world, it's only natural that his understanding of the Roman Confederacy would be based upon the understanding of Carthage. If the Carthaginian quote-unquote allies were desperate to throw off the Carthaginian yoke at the first opportunity, Hannibal could have easily assumed this would also be the case for Rome. Hannibal's strategy hinged upon drawing the Allies away from Rome. This would solve his big problem of fighting a war in Italy, supply and logistics. Rome's great strength was Italy. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of legionaries could be raised. And if they died, tens, hundreds of thousands more would be ready to take their place. This would come in handy during the heavy defeats of the early years. If the Romans needed to replenish troops, they could be instantly mustered. In contrast, the base of Carthaginian manpower was Spain, which, as you can see from this map, is a long way from Italy. Getting troops to Italy from Spain was quite difficult. Hannibal had managed the feat by marching through Gaul and over the Alps, but he had sustained heavy losses. Livy mentions in Book 21, Chapter 8, that Hannibal started out with a force of 150,000 when he was attacking Saguntum. By the time he was at the Trebia, over here near the Po, um, his force was estimated at 40,000. Nearly two-thirds had been lost before he'd even started the war proper. It would have been preferable to transport the men by sea. This would have been relatively easy. After the First Punic War, the Romans largely surrendered control of the sea, feeling it unnatural and much preferring to fight and live honestly on the land. However, Carthage never constructed a navy to adequately resupply Hannibal. From this, Hannibal's strategy is easy to deduce. Rather than focus on resupplying himself, he would cut off Rome's ability to rebuild the legions after a defeat. He would do this by turning Italy against Rome. This had the added benefit that Hannibal seemed to struggle with sieges. Just look at how his mammoth force of 150,000 was held by Saguntum. After Cannae, Hannibal gave his attention to Capua, the jewel of Campania, and the rich Greek cities of the south. These seemed obvious targets given Rome's control, uh, I mean, given Rome's conflict against the Greeks when they called for Pyrrhus of Epirus to aid them. However, the project failed. Why? Rome gets credited with a lot of innovations. The aqueduct and sanitation and the roads, obviously the roads. The roads go without saying, don't they? Irrigation, medicine, education, and the wine. That's something you'd really miss if the Romans left. Baths. Oh, and it's safe to walk in the streets at night. And they certainly knew how to keep order, if you know what I mean. There is one thing also that you can say the Romans did for us. Open citizenship. 
if you look back at the Greek cities of the classical and archaic era, here is a picture of a Greek city in case you forgot what one was. Their main political unit was the polis, a word often translated as city-state. Citizenship was a treasure highly guarded by each polis. If we look at the greatest polis of them all, the debatable best polis of them all, Athens and Attica, uh, in the year two, uh, the year 450 BC, uh, modern estimates are there are around uh, 50,000 adult male citizens, in addition to a similar but probably slightly smaller number of metics, a metic coming from the Greek word uh, metoikoi, uh, meaning a person who lives away from home, uh, basically a non-citizen resident. Um, in Asuka, there were restrictions on what a metic couldn't and couldn't do, such as a metic couldn't participate in the Athenian democracy and couldn't own property. Uh, and then in addition to this, there were slaves. Athens was a slave society. Uh, estimates for number of slaves range between 80 to 200,000. Um, but anyway, in the year uh, 451, Pericles introduced a citizenship law requiring that an Athenian could only be a citizen if both of their parents were citizens. This was fairly common practice and led to declining populations. By the end of the Peloponnesian War, uh, so probably about 50 years after the law was introduced, uh, the number of Athenian citizens had roughly halved. Between the years 680 BC and 330 BC, the number of Spartan equals, basically their equivalent of citizens, declined from 9,000 to under 1,000. With declining populations, it was only natural that the Greek polis only maintained preeminence for a short period of time. The Athenians for the 5th century BC, then the Thebans for the 4th, before ultimately they were overshadowed by the Hellenistic kingdoms of Macedonia, Syria and Egypt, before ultimately Rome. Rome had a very different policy regarding citizenship, both for allies and for slaves. Manumission was much more common in Rome than Greece or Carthage, and freed slaves could become citizens. Likewise, political power was shared with other states. Tusculum was given full citizenship perhaps in the year 381 BC. The cities of Rome's region, Latium, held Latin citizenship, which included many rights, such as Canubium and Comercium. Appian describes the process um, immediately a bit later on chronologically in Book 1, Chapter 7, quote, and as they, sub and as they subdued successive parts of Italy by war, the Romans confiscated a portion of the land and founded towns, this being the alternative to uh, fires and garrisons. Uh, the captured land uh, became theirs on each occasion. They distributed the cultivated area at once to settlers or sold or leased it. But since they did not have time to allocate the very large quantity that was then lying uncultivated, as a result of hostilities, they announced that this could for the moment be worked by anyone who wishes at a rent of one-tenth of the produce for arable land and one-fifth for orchards. Rents were also set for pastured land and for large and small beasts. By this way, they did increase the num they hoped to increase the number of people of Italy, whom they consider exceptionally tough, so that they could have their kin to fight alongside them. End quote. This sense of shared interest made the Italian gave the Italians a greater sense of loyalty to Rome. When Hannibal visited the cities of Italy, he would have done so with a mixture of Africans, Spaniards, and Gallic warriors, which the Italians would have undoubtedly viewed as barbarians. With Rome, they had common customs, history, and religion. It was a relatively simple choice to stay loyal. While there were few notable defections to Carthage, such as Capua and Brundisium, the majority stayed firm. With Rome able to continue to supply itself, defeat seemed inevitable. Hannibal realised the need for a change in approach ten years into the war, instructing his brother Hasdrubal to bring reinforcements from Spain through another overland march. The end result of this was the Battle of the Metaurus, in which the Roman general Marcellus was victorious. All that was left for the Romans to do was inflict the death blow, which Scipio Africanus was able to do at Zama. So, by a simple act of looking at the overlooked period of the war, which contained less highlights, 
our understanding of the conflict shifts. Hannibal's failure to march in Rome is no longer his great mistake. We instead see his misunderstanding of Italian politics, itself a product of his own impression of Carthage, caused him to underestimate the extent to which he would need to resupply his forces, defeating him before the war ever began. All the Romans needed to do was survive, which they did under the guidance of Quintus Fabius Maximus, giving us Fabian tactics. A more accurate version of events, one not seen by focusing entirely on the highlights. It's right there, hidden in plain sight. You just need to look at it to understand the detail that the details of an event can completely change your perspective. This was my starting point in my initial idea for this conference by looking at the Seven Years' War and how strong traits in that conflict can tell the story of the American Revolution. See, I told you we'd get to it eventually. Simple versions of the American Revolution go, the British tried to tax Americans, the Boston Tea Party happened, resistance spread, and the Americans threw off the British yoke. It's not inaccurate, but it doesn't remotely tell the whole picture. Most Americans were loyal to the British and would have happily stayed British citizens if they had their own parliament to tax them. It was impossible for the British to force America to do anything. That was made abundantly clear by the Stamp Act crisis. It was faulty British imperial policy being needlessly provocative that forced an unwilling population into rebellion and there was very little the British could do about it. Once the Americans decided not to be a British colony. However, this version of the story is less glamorous and more detail driven, so gets missed when you only focus on the highlights. This doesn't make it any less interesting though. If I had another 20 minutes, I'd love to talk about the collapse of the Roman Empire in the fifth century AD and how by looking more closely at Roman actions, you can see a sophisticated defensive system in place, which made use of counterbalancing uh, Fordorati. But alas, we do not have all day. History is a notoriously complicated subject. Everything is interconnected. The student of history must be aware that if they have only a cursory knowledge of the subject, they will almost certainly have a warped view of it. It's not to dismiss the value of an introduction. Everybody needs to start somewhere. But if you don't go beyond the introduction, you're likely to miss things. And that is where I'll end it. Uh... Great. Well, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so uh, if you're ready for me to fire away, I will fire away. Um, ben asks, um, there was a Senate in Rome and equivalent in other cities. Once they were all Roman citizens, how did the main Senate retain control over the other governing bodies was it like westminster <laughs> re the <laughs> active union <laughs> and were they governors <laughs> you know there's a lot of similarities between the roman senate and westminster to be honest um namely they were always well guided when they followed an active union and when they didn't they caused problems so typically um what would happen is um, there was an office in Rome called the censor who had control over Senate roles. So if you wanted to be a senator, what you needed to do was to um, have a high profile. So you could do that by being a Roman citizen. So as, uh, over time, as citizenship was expanded, um, you'd become a Roman citizen. Then you could start standing for Roman offices. You could become a, uh, a quaestor, which is the lowest of the uh, political offices. Um, and then with the atten that would get you attention. Um, you'd probably have a patron in Rome, someone to help you climb your way up the ladder, and then they would get you into the Senate. So it was done gradually. Um, and then over time, um, so when you start getting into the imperial period, it would be the emperor who'd have control. So you'd have um, particular emperors would start recruiting senators from the provinces to reflect the changing nature of the empire. You start to see that really from the second century AD. Um, had the British done that with America, they would have had a much easier time of things. Um, when the Romans resisted, um, when they resisted uh, 
expanding citizenship as they did um, in the first century BC, the end result was the social war uh, because they wouldn't share with the other children. When the British tried that with the Americans, what they got was the War of Independence. Which they won because it was further away. Yeah, it's um. <laughs> always, if you're going to subjugate people, always have a large army close by. That's good. Yeah. Good dictatorial strategies. I'm taking notes. Common sense. Um, <laughs> we've got another question, uh, which is um, how much of Hannibal's problem was a lack of political support from Carthage? Wasn't Carthage a sea trading empire, so why didn't they provide naval support? That is a very good point. Um, so there were two main factions at Rome. Um, not Robert Carthage, um, Hannibal's um, backed faction, and another led by someone called Hanno, who appears throughout Livy, constantly trying to thwart um, Hannibal um, and suppress the war. Because Carthage, it, Carthage it's got to be remembered, they weren't militaristic people. They were far more commercially minded. Um, the empire was nice while it got them uh, resources, but if it was going to be a drain on how much money they had, they weren't in favour of it. So um, they were, I guess, unwilling to make the financial um, investment that was necessary. Though at the same time, Hannibal could have done more to get support from Carthage. Like he doesn't seem to have accounted for that in his whole supply um, strategy. Um, he seems to have been so focused on the idea that he could peel off the Romans within a few, uh, the Romans' allies in a few years, and that would solve all his problems. So while there may be people in Carthage who didn't like him, that didn't matter. Spain may be really far away, but that didn't matter. It was only after about 15 years of getting nowhere that you can see the wheels starting to turn and these working out that, oh, this isn't actually going to work out. So there wasn't a lot of plunder coming from his uh, invasion of Italy. No, it just... Drain on the Carthaginian resources. Yeah, just throwing money away. I think one of the things that people often um, lose sight of or, uh, over time is how expensive conquest is and how expensive war is. Like most of the time, it doesn't actually help you that much. Like there are limited circumstances where going out and taking someone's money, that's going to make you rich. But a lot of the time, it's going to make you very poor. And that's all that the... Um, so while Hannibal's efforts in Spain and getting the silver mines, that was going to get him money. Italy, there wasn't much wealth that he was going to get from it. Um, and because he didn't have the support in Italy, he never really got any in the first place. Everything was just reinvested in supporting his mm. army. That's where all the money was going. You weren't likely to see any profit until the end of it. Now, moving forward in the centuries, um, do you have a ballpark figure of how many citizens of the 13 colonies remained loyal after hostilities broke out? That is a good question. Um, I think it's... Um, I guess it depends on when you think of hostilities as breaking out. So there are signs of conflict by the early uh, 1760s, and you can see probably a few thousand people, um, particularly in key centres like Boston, um, who are really unhappy with the British, but they're not getting anywhere. It's only when the British start being really provocative, like with the Stamp Act, um, that popular support starts to turn against them. By the time that conflict itself breaks out, You've probably got maybe a third of the colonies have a significant number to, uh, particularly in the north, to um, really push the British back. So if you're going to look at a rough estimate, I'd say um, at the start of the conflict, probably one third against the British and then two thirds willing to be persuaded. So over time, they gradually fall towards America when the British uh, give them no choice. And people didn't fall away as the war went on? Um, I'd say, yeah, gradually um, 
they just became more and more supportive of the Americans as the British just didn't help themselves. Um, because when it comes down to it, the Americans didn't see themselves as that distinct from the British. They were, uh, I think the phrase like English gentlemen is the phrase that appears all the time in like the um, text of the, or the writings of the, uh, Virginian di- uh, the Virginian dynasty. So like the super wealthy men in the colonies, they all thought of themselves as, oh, we're proper, um, or like we have English liberties. So like the um, right of parliamentary sovereignty being the main one, which is where the right to um, no representation without taxation comes from. It's a right as an English gentleman. Whereas the British themselves thought of that, of parliamentary sovereignty as being British, like the British parliament the uh, people in the colonies thought of it in terms of each colonial legislature was its own version of parliament. So that's where the rights came from. And you get the sense that most Americans didn't want to fight the British because they're basically the same people. It's just stop winding us up. Like you need to meet us halfway here. Like we're not going to blindly be taxed just because your parliament, which doesn't represent us, say so. So if you give us a little bit of leeway, we'll um, we'll stop fighting. But the British just wouldn't. They were stubborn and eventually just pushed the Americans away. Great. And, and sticking to the, the American Revolution, uh, someone asked a question about how that conflict is viewed by most Americans. And do you feel the popular play Hamilton has helped in any way correct some of the most popular misconceptions of that historical conflict. I think it's helps. I love Hamilton. Um, Yes. (laughs) I mean, like, I've got uh, next Friday booked off so I can have it when it goes on Disney Plus. I'm so excited for Hamilton. Um, It's Yeah, it's going on Disney Plus with the original cast. Uh, So if anyone is not on Disney Plus, get that by next Friday. You can watch Hamilton. I'm not being paid for Disney by by Disney for that plug. Um, I think it helps um, negate some of the the send. I think because the the American Revolution, particularly in America, has a bit of a mythic status. Um, I think too much attention generally gets thrust upon Washington. Washington single handedly won the war. Um, and then gradually there are obvious um, caveats around that, like the support of the British, not the British, the French. Um, the other founding fathers played their own very influential roles. I think Hamilton does a great job of getting across the um, broad spread of um, the uh, founding fathers, that it wasn't just Washington. There were a lot of key players in there, um, like how much... Um, I mean, like Jefferson obviously gets a lot of attention, but Madison and Hamilton get a lot of attention in Hamilton. And I think that's very good. But I think it also falls into some of the same traps that a lot of uh, histo- here, that a lot of historiography around the, Ameri- around the American Revolution does. In that, I think there's a line in it somewhere like, how does a ragtag army in need of a shower defeat a global superpower? And Britain couldn't hold on to the Americans like it's. I think that's the main thing that gets lost, particularly in a lot of scholarship written by Americans about the American Revolution, is how inevitable it was that the British just. You can't control a continent that's 4,000 miles away with a couple thousand troops. You can't do it. There were 3 million people out there. If they don't want to be ruled by you, they're not going to be ruled by you. If the Americans decided, like, no, we don't, as they did after the British pushed them away, then it's it's only a matter of time. Another line from Hamilton, if you see what I did there. Um, I think, and actually, further to that point as well, uh, on the comments, we've got uh, one from J.E. Young saying, um, Let's not forget that the French, that the French, and how much they help the colonists, and they're often completely left out. Absolutely, the um, uh, guns and ships. I think being uh, one of my favourite songs from Hamilton. That um, <laughs> the like you can't fight a revolution without guns and ships. You need supplies, 
and the French and the other European, um, I don't know what it's called, the Allies against the British, like they were so vital in supplying the um, resources that the Americans needed. Mm. So was the French. Um, and, and what about your podcast? Is uh, How would you say your approach is different or similar to the American Revolution podcast by Michael Troy in the American Revolution period? I've got to say I've not. I don't know the podcast. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, great. Well, let's go back in time again then. And uh, someone asks that given the social war and all the struggles over Italian citizenship, the next over the next centuries it seems like hannibal missed opportunities to peel away support from rome not that these opportunities were that weren't there thoughts that's very interesting the um so the social war is probably one of the most interesting bits of all of roman history and i think it's a bit of a great shame actually that it gets overshadowed by being right before the civil wars that because everyone jumps to um, uh, like uh, Caesar, Pompey, Octavian, Mark, Mark Antony fighting, but the social war, it, it's got to be remembered that while they did, the Allies broke away from Rome and the Allies set up their own Italian um, confederacy to rival Rome. It has to be remembered it was modelled upon Rome. And it was only done because they'd spent the past 50 years appealing to get equality with the uh, the Romans. Uh, so from the in the middle to late Republic, um, how it would work is that legions were split between Roman legions and allied legions. There'd be an equal number raised. So when you go off to war, you might have a cons uh, consul would lead two Roman legions and two allied legions. Basically, trained the same way, basically fighting the same way. But when you get to the end of the war, 90% of the spoils, and this is off when they're, ra uh, they're raiding Greece and taking Greek money, so that's why they're making money. Um, they get back to Italy, and the Romans take 90% of the wealth and give 10% to the Allies. And the Allies wanted equality with the Romans rather than to break away. So as soon as Rome, the Romans had common sense and they actually offer equality and they actually offer Roman citizenship to the allies, all the fighting just fades away. They all, um, I think there are a few holdouts like the, uh, those classic rogues, the Samnites, who never want to bow down to the Romans. But most of the Italians wanted equality rather than independence. And um, I think that's the key difference, is that Hannibal was offering the Italians independence in a Capua-led league of cities, which they didn't want. They wanted to be Roman. So I think had Hannibal invaded maybe, uh, let's say he invaded 150 years later, he attacked during the Social War, which is a really good uh, alternative history. I'd love to get the, the Twilight histories on that. Um, I think the Allies would join in initially and then the Romans would panic and just give citizenship to all the Italians and then the Italians would leave Hannibal high and dry. <laughs> but that's a very good question, whoever asked that. I like the way your mind works. Simon Stark should have been in the talk about the Westeros. Um, <laughs> Well, if, if I can, uh, can I ask you a question as you're doing a bit of uh, comparative history here? Um, yeah, sure. How, how instructive do you think it is to compare periods? Um, and do you think that the, the end of the Roman, Roman Republic can tell us anything about the state of the American Republic today? Oh, uh, I love a good analogy. Um, I think, and, I'll, and the... Um, the end of the Roman Republic is one of the great analogies out there. Like whenever anything is going wrong, you can use the end of the Roman Republic to learn something. Um, I think it can be, uh, it can give you new ways to think about problems. Like something I was thinking about the other day uh, when I was preparing for this. Um, so I spent basically the past uh, month just engrossed in Roman history, trying to 
get ready for this in the ancient history panel, which I'll hopefully see you all on later. Um, and how diverging interests uh, amongst the citizen amongst the elites within the citizenry um, can destabilize a country, and how the mega rich of the um, late republic that when they realize that their own interests are no longer aligned with anyone but themselves, like they don't need the support of the state, they can operate independently due to their vast wealth, how that um, negates, um, like how the cohesion of society sort of fall apart, falls apart at that point. And considering the debates that we've been having um, around the efficacy of billionaires, I thought that was an interesting comparison. Like, what happens when you get people who are able to operate completely independently of a state? So like, how does that affect a society? And I think analogies on the whole offer, it, offer very useful ways to think about things, but shouldn't be instructive. Like, because something happened in Rome doesn't mean it'll happen in uh the modern era it's just an interesting way to get you to think of um new ideas like to try and trip your own mind up in the way that you think about or the way you conceive about whatever you're trying to compare if that makes sense i started rambling a bit towards the end there no no, no that's fascinating no so you're saying you shouldn't put a plutocrat in charge <laughs> <laughs> i guess so <laughs> not to bring politics too much into this I'm just going to no. say, electing a billionaire is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Um, great. Well, if, it, if anyone else, I don't, oh, there's another one. Late. And somebody asks, uh, so Rome eventually figured out to expand. Oops, that one. Oh, sorry. So Rome eventually figured out to expand full set fifth full citizenship to surrounding Italians, while Britain failed to do that with the communities. Oh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. I think uh, it's more of a commentary, but, but uh, it said that you know what what Rome did was oh, figure yeah. out that that it should expand citizenship to surrounding Italians, while Britain failed to do that with the colonials. You know what? That is exactly what I'm saying. I didn't think I was going to say that at the beginning of the talk. But that's kind of where I've ended up. Um, yeah. I mean, like, had the British a um, set up a American parliament that could um, that uh, King George would be monarch, and then instead of going to Westminster, uh, they could all be uh, meeting in Philadelphia. I think you'd have had no American Revolution, at least not for another century. Or had they brought um, American MPs into Westminster, no revolution. Essentially, what we did with Canada and Australia. Yeah, very much. That, that, that's how I'd imagine it would go. Ah, in fact, that's what Matt Gray says is, why did Canada stay British? Canada, why does Canada stay? Um, Canada is interesting for many reasons. Um, it's So when you look at uh, that, it's something that has to be taken into account in the American Revolution, um, is that it wasn't just 13 colonies. There were really um, 17. Um, I think there were the two Floridas, um, Quebec and Nova Scotia, who didn't rebel, um, both of which were relatively new into the imperial system. They hadn't had the same um, conflicts that had been dragging the... uh, Whoops dragging on for the British. And at the same time, uh, they were both low population areas, so much easier for the British to control. Like the uh, colony of the 13 that stayed the most loyal was Georgia, which is the most recently brought in and the one with the smallest population. So um, a large reason is the population sizes of the various uh, colonies. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we need to wrap up now. That was absolutely fascinating. I really, really enjoyed that. And I think on behalf of the audience, uh, many thanks. Thank you for having me. And great to speak with you all. Bye.